things off. Thank you, Laurie, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we have a great turnout for Earth Day. Uh, it's a remarkably competitive field today, and to see all of you here is really exciting. Let, for those of you who are new to Cary, and uh, I haven't seen the poll results yet, so uh, I'm just assuming it's usually about a third to half of our audience. Um, let's see, uh, is this your first time? Wow, 48% right in the top of that range. Um, let me just say a few words about the Cary Institute. Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies is an independent research institute, which means we are not part of any other organization or university. Uh, we have about 100 staff, 25 PhD scientists, and we work in four main areas of ecology. We work in urban ecology, freshwater ecology, uh, disease ecology, and particularly work on pandemic spillover, which has been busy this year, uh, and forest ecology, and understanding the dynamics and relationships between and among all these different ecologies. We like to work at scale, we like big scale, and that's why we say we're an ecosystem science organization. Now, people ask me, you know, Rapapro of today, you know, do you work on climate change? And I like to say, you can't be a biologist in the 21st century and not work on climate change. It underlies everything we do. Uh, and so we have lots of data and work uh, that we do on climate change. We're based in Millbrook, New York, about 100 miles north of New York City. I say that because looking at the geography, uh, I would say that we are hyper dispersed tonight. Lots of people in the Northeast, but I saw Montana, California, a couple of people from Chattanooga, Tennessee in the South. Um, you know, it's, it's quite a uh, wonderful uh, out pouring of, of community tonight. Um, so let me start by introducing our speaker, Ray Wynn Grant. Now, Ray is a carnivore biologist. She is a National Geographic Explorer. She has a distinguished pedigree, having done her undergraduate degree at Emory, her master's degree at Yale. Uh, now we call it the Yale School of the Environment. It was the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Sciences when Ray was there. Uh, she worked on, uh, in East Africa on lions and then did her PhD uh, out of Columbia University, uh, working with a man named John Beckman and the people of the Nevada Fish and Game out in the Great Basin um, around Lake Tahoe, Tahoe on um, black bears. Um, Ray then left uh, her graduate degree with a PhD uh, and went to work as a postdoctoral fellow at the American Museum of Natural History and Geographic, and she now works uh, with the Nature Conservancy at uh, the Dangermond uh, Preserve and is on faculty at University of California, Santa Barbara. Now you may have noticed that I did that without looking at a single note. And that's because her PhD advisors were Eleanor Sterling and me. So I feel exceptional pride in introducing Ray and having her come on tonight. Uh, and so Ray, join us, would you please? Hello, I'm here. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, well, everybody, for showing up. <laughs> good. And, uh, you know, as I ask questions tonight, you guys will understand. I actually know the answers to some of these because we work so closely together for so long. But it's really an honor. Ray has always been an exceptional communicator of science. And so I am really pleased she agreed uh, to do our Earth Day presentation. So let me just start in with, with you know, the how's a nice girl like you become a bear biologist, right? You're a, a carnivore <laughs> biologist, but what is it to be a carnivore biologist? And, and how did you get there? Oh, sure. So I, you know, Josh, you know this, but I love to talk about my fairly non-traditional path or what I think is a non-traditional path into this field. And one of the reasons I feel that I'm often very different from my colleagues is because I had such an urban upbringing. So I was born in a big city. Um, I always lived with my family moved around a lot, but always to big cities. And we didn't recreate in nature. So I don't have a background going camping or hiking or hunting or fishing or any of those things with my family. But I do have a background of sitting on my grandparents' living room floor and watching nature shows on TV. And that's how I first got my tastes of nature and how I fell in love with it because I wanted nothing more when I was you know, seven and eight than to be a nature show host. And I basically learned along the way, mostly through school, as Josh mentioned in my intro, I did a lot of school but along the way, I realized that there's a science to what I was seeing on these nature shows. Um, I was being you know, informally introduced to wildlife ecology. 
And once I realized that that was a field and that was a path and that was also um, a career that could affect change and help save a lot of these species from extinction or at least try to, I, you know, I really felt that that was for me. And I had a pretty linear trajectory after that solidified, <laughs> after I, it made sense and I got it. And, and I'm doing it today. Yeah, all things being equal, you know, linear is a relative statement. Um, you know, I think everybody sort of goes in, in little patterns. But, you know, it's the, I, I love that it's the David Attenborough effect, right? You know, David Attenborough is just responsible. You know, mm -hmm. people like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, uh, David Beach, mm -hmm. George Schaller. These are people from my childhood who, who were responsible for me becoming a biologist. And so mm -hmm. it's really wonderful. And I think people may underrate uh, you know, if your kids are stuck in front of the TV, just make them watch the right programs. Um, it really can have a powerful impact. And so one of the things that I love about your work is you're an ecologist, but you're really interested in the social drivers, right? And the social ecology of conservation and particularly not just how bears live and what bears need, but also how bears and humans interact and understanding not just the, you know, people mm -hmm. put out food, bears take it, we have to shoot the bear, but the whole social dynamics that goes on. And I, I was wondering, you know, how do we make, how do we use that to help bears coexist better? What tools do we have in the toolkit? Oh, absolutely. There's so many, you know, I have to say, I just always am gonna have to give credit where credit is due in this conversation. So Josh, you in particular <laughs> really helped me and graduate school understand the importance of patterns, you know, not just looking at what's happening right now, but what are the patterns over time? And in studying bears, that was really, um, you know, actually kind of easy to do because bears in the places that I have studied had been there for a number of years. And so we could see, you know, what were the patterns in their behavior and what does that mean in terms of how humans can best coexist with them? And, you know, there's tons of patterns, but one of the things I love about bears is that they're really motivated by food. You know, they're so much like people. They want to eat, they want to eat a lot, and then they want to sleep a lot. And those parts of their, you know, instincts drive so many of their patterns. And so, you know, one of the main things that I find myself communicating is, with people is about food, you know, and how bears can look at almost anything as food. So whether it is, you know, the decorative fish pond that you have in your yard or the dwarf fruit trees or, you know, even your dog's food bowl that's in the backyard, whatever it is, they can smell it from miles away. You know, uh, a fact that I think is just so fascinating is that scientists have yet to figure out how to measure how far away bears can smell. Um, because every time we measure it, it, it pushes us further and further back. So we think, you know, several miles away, bears have this incredible sense of smell. You know, yeah. smell the shampoo that you washed your hair with, you know. Well, and, and it must be bizarre to live in a world as a carnivore dog, a bear, a, a tiger, and, and being able to smell that way. Absolutely. There's so much in our environments now that they didn't evolve to understand, you know, they didn't evolution wasn't happening at the same time as, you know, artificial sense. And so there's a lot that makes them confused. And as it turns out, you know, I've spent more than a decade now studying bears. And as it turns out, it's studying people that gives me the best idea of how to manage bears and protect them, you know, figuring out human behaviors, what humans are are more or less likely to do um, with their own properties and you know with their own behavior in the outdoors. That helps me figure out what bears need and what's possible for coexistence. And and what are you know because biologists, field biologists, have some really cool tools. Yeah. What are the kinds of tools you use to study the bears and maybe talk a little bit about how you use those tools out in Nevada and in around Tahoe. So. Uh, there are so many tools that I use. And so for our viewers right now, I wanna say the most important one that we will both share is bear spray. Please, <laughs> I beg of you, when you go to recreate in nature or if you are yourself a biologist, then you already know that bear spray is so important. Even with black bears, bring it with you. You can't fly with it. So you have to purchase it wherever you go. But that's the thing that I have on my hip whenever I am doing my field work or hiking around, but most importantly with fieldwork is bear spray. 
um, you know, it doesn't harm bears. So it's a really humane way to keep yourself safe if you're ever encountering one. So that's my big tool that I want to put first and foremost. And then second, I am a stickler for GPS. And when I first got started, GPS devices were big and were clunky, both on the bear and in my hands. And now they're so sleek. So I use a GPS unit. Um, you know, it's, it's not unlike what we have in our phones, right? So really slim. And it tells me where I am all the time. And it helps me take points. So if I'm out in the forest and I see a bear, I'll put a GPS point. It gives me the longitude and latitude. But also if I see bear scat, I can take a GPS point. If I see a tree with claw marks, I take a GPS point or any kind of sign of a bear. And then bear is like the one in the image on the screen that I work with have a GPS collar around their necks. And it's not heavy. I often get the question, is it heavy? And it, it looks heavy, but it's big and bulky, but not heavy, very light. And it's a simple device GPS collar around their neck, it sends a signal to a satellite in outer space. And then that satellite sends a signal to my computer and tells me the exact longitude and latitude of that bear every say four hours for up to a year. And that gives me so much data. And so if I talk about tools that I use, it's, you know, that's the biggest one. I could do all of my work with just my little GPS unit and the one that goes around the bear's neck. But what you'll also see in the image is a stethoscope because every so often I'm dealing with hibernating bears like, like this one. And I think we'll talk about that a little more later on in the program. And I also give them a checkup. You know, I check their breathing rates. I check their heart rates to make sure they're okay. I record all of that data. And then the other thing that I'll say is a real, two other things are really great tools that I use. One is a camera trap and a camera trap is also called a camera. And so we set them up, they are camouflage, they are motion sensor cameras that I will tie to a tree and usually I just get images of myself walking back and forth trying to find it. And the camera trap takes pictures of bears if I'm lucky um, or everything that's not a bear. And one of the things I love about them is it, and Josh has done tons of work that's similar is that camera traps allow us to monitor bears and their behavior in a non-invasive way. So it doesn't necessitate us capturing the animal or sedating the animal, but we can really observe individuals and their families um, you know, quite passively. And it's a huge, huge, huge contributor to a lot of really good wildlife ecology. So power to the camera. The last thing, um, is my binoculars and that, you know, is kind of silly, but I'm talking about bears here. So unless I'm super prepared, I mostly want to observe them from a distance. And so binoculars come in really handy and I'm not a birder or anything like that. So I'm not usually looking up. I'm usually looking out or kind of down with my binoculars, but I got to have them. So those are my main tools that I use for my work. Yeah. And, and I think binoculars have been the main tool for field biologists forever. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> So I, I also like the the purple bandana is is really cool. Um, I think that it's bear is very cool stylish. Accessory, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you know, and and it looks like we're tying her mouth shut in this image, and that's that's not what's happening. The bandana is actually supposed to cover her eyes. So right. you know, the bears are sedated, but fairly lightly sedated. We don't like to give them too much drugs, and so because of that, we cover their eyes in case you know they blink a little bit. We just don't want to stress yeah. them out. Right. So you spent a number of years working out in Nevada and I was wondering what are the, you know, what are the main take homes? What are the things you discovered that you felt were most interesting? Oh my goodness. I know I it's go paper on. after paper after paper, but. Um, <laughs> I could go what? on. Um, so, so there were some discoveries that were made while I was just ramping up my own data collection. And that was super, super interesting. So I'll try to make it brief, but in short, the state of Nevada is, is very unique in terms of the Western United States and wildlife because so much of it is desert. It's super dry and super arid. And although there are mountain ranges, it's primarily characterized by like low shrub bushes and um, you know, desert environments. And bears are a water limited species. So that means, you know, they are large mammals. They need to drink water, you know, running water with their tongue fairly often, and they can't go too far from a permanent water source. 
So when I started my work in Nevada, we were all under the impression that black bears were a new species to that ecosystem, that because of conservation efforts and range expansion, that over time, black bears from California were going up and over the Sierra Nevada mountains and into Nevada for the first time. A lot of the people living in the western part of the state had never encountered bears there before. That was super interesting in itself. But as a couple years went by into the study, it turned out that some of my colleagues got some different information and not from scientific records, but they went through old library archives from pioneer journals, from um, the notes, the field notes and the publications of settlers who were you know, coming from the Eastern United States into the West making drastic change and also making, you know, history. And they were noting that they were encountering black bears in Nevada, in different parts of Nevada. And so it was this, you know, I, I remember when I first learned this, and it's a story that I still love to tell about how old pioneer journals found in the dusty archives of a library actually changed our understanding of wildlife ecology today because as it turns out, bears weren't novel to Nevada. They had historically been there in small populations, but they had been there. And that meant that essentially they were recolonizing historic habitat. And that changes ev everything that we had known before about the study. And all of a sudden it meant bears belong. You know, They belong there, they contribute to the ecosystem in some way and their conservation is extra important. Well, and you've, you've had the pleasure of working on a population of bears that not just is in recovery, but is growing significantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's growing at the same time that the area around Tahoe, I mean, I know the bears are out in the, in the, in the more wild areas, but people are moving there. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have increasing bear populations, you have increasing human populations. How is that manifesting itself in terms of wild, human wildlife conflict? It's really difficult and, and it creates a lot of misconceptions, that's for sure. So I find that I have to really correct people in their understandings of what's going on. Because like in this image, as the human population's growing and the bear population's growing and humans are expanding into bear habitat, we're finding that bears are really attracted to the resources, especially things like garbage. You know, garbage is full of discarded food and bears really wanna eat it. And so, these interactions or conflicts are happening so much more frequently and sometimes in Tahoe every day that a lot of people feel that most bears are coming into town. You know, most of the bears are, are becoming, you know, attracted to these food resources. And in reality, most of the bears are staying, like Josh, like you just said, they're staying in the back country or staying in the forest. But because we have more bears and more people, we're having more incidents. And it's really not very complicated. Bears are attracted to mostly food resources, food and water resources. They're hungry and they need consistent food sources. And at the same time, they're really, really smart animals. And there are easy ways to condition them to find their food in the forest as opposed to in town. The main thing is bear proof garbage cans. And for those of you who are tuning in from um, different parts of New York state, you might be super familiar with bear proof garbage cans. We try to get them out to everybody. Um, and some states require it and some states don't. And Nevada is still on the cusp of making it a requirement. But bear proof garbage cans discourage bears from entering people's properties and going into town and scavenging in that way. And they're really, really effective. So well, my, my main thing is to encourage people, if you're having problems with bears, before you do anything else, can you please try the bear proof garbage can and then get back to me? Right, and, and you know, I think bears naturally are not just omnivores, but they're like the ultimate om omnivore. They'll eat everything from a berry uh, to a deer, right? And, and anything in between in terms of size or, or quality. So, so our garbage is really attractive because it's a mix of all these great things that they love. Mm -hmm. so, and high uh, calories. I mean, we've and, also found, you know, and, and my colleagues in Nevada were the ones to write the papers on this, but they found that bears that scavenge on fast food, you know, garbage, but especially fast food dumpsters, um, 
become more ecologically fit to an extent. So ecological fitness kind of means their ability to pass on their genes into the gene pool. So having babies. Having lots of kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're finding yeah. that these fat garbage bears uh, enter into reproductive maturity faster and then have more babies earlier than the bears in the backcountry in the forest. And although that sounds good in terms of evolution and fit and ecological fitness, it's not so good because it's dangerous to be a trash bear. They're crossing yeah. roads to get to these trash cans. They're interacting with people who want them gone and possibly, you know, killed, uh, lethally removed. And so they're more likely to have babies earlier, but they're also more likely to die earlier. Right. And then that thus reduces fitness. Well, and and you found that that road, you know, roads are dangerous, right? Um, and mm -hmm. people are dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. So, you were working in Nevada, and you've added in. Uh, and by the way, I really love that Ray is consistently and, and frequently mentioning that this was a team effort. I mean, she worked with a remarkable yes. group of people, uh, and they really they've been doing the work for a long time. And and again. This is where scientists are really great because they recognize they had a lot of data that they were never going to use. And they said, well, right, you want to make a PhD? And she then went and trapped bears and collared bears and added to their data set. And this sort of communal process of research is really important for people to get. I mean, field biologists are, you know, Ray and I are both field biologists. Interestingly, we're both urban, you know, urban kids. But I think field biologists are somewhat schizophrenic. We really yeah. love being out in the middle yeah. of nowhere by ourselves. But many of us are also very social. So it's uh -huh. there's this two pieces to it. So you've started a new project. And I'm glad it's your dog barking, not my dog barking. Um, no, forgive me. Yeah, yeah, no, I've got two behind me and I'm just waiting for it. Um, uh, now you're working out in the Great Plains of Northeastern Montana and looking at a different bear, uh, a grizzly as now we see. Um, Tell, tell us a little bit about that project, how it got started and what you're doing there. I love this project. It's very, very new for me, very, very different um, because it's, you know, there are some things that are the same. It's still bears, it's still their movement and behavior, and it's still understanding where human bear conflicts may arise. But it's a surprisingly different system. You know, I never would have predicted that Nevada and Montana would be so different in terms of how I'm researching the animals there, but it really, really is. So I am primarily looking at grizzly bear movement and behavior in terms of their expansion and what we might predict will happen in the future which is really, really fun. So if any of you all out there are following Grizzly News lately, you might know that there's a lot of discussions about whether they should remain an endangered species or not because their population sizes have increased. So again, as, as we are doing this presentation today, grizzly bears are listed on the endangered species list. Um, I won't get into my, too many of my opinions on whether they should stay there or not, but right now it's, it's a safe space for them uh, listed as endangered species. But there's been so much conservation effort put towards restoring their populations, especially in the strongholds like Yellowstone and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Glacier National Park ecosystem. And so the population sizes in those national parks, and you can see on this map here, and I'll get into what all these colors mean in a second, but in Yellowstone and Glacier, there are a good number of grizzly bears, so many that they need to move into other habitat. I have been focusing my efforts on the Northern Great Plains. So the area in Eastern Montana that is grassland and was once home to tons and tons of bison, um, many different indigenous groups and lots of wildlife, including grizzly bears and wolves. Historically, they were not just mountain dwelling species. They were out in the plains. And it appears that grizzly bears are making their way back. They are not being translocated, you know, to eastern Montana. They are walking on their forepaws quite slowly. Um, from the Yellowstone and Glacier areas eastward to the Great Plains. And there is an organization called the American Prairie Reserve. Um, it's both a nonprofit and an actual physical place, a protected area called the American Prairie Reserve. And APR is a nonprofit that is trying to restore parts of the Northern Great Plains back to, you know, the full native wildlife community, including grizzly bears. And again, they have relocated some animals, some herbivores like bison, 
but they're waiting for predators to get there on their own. And so I did a whole bunch of field work and then a whole bunch of statistics um, to make a map that looks like this. And this is what we call a connectivity map, a connectivity model. And the connectivity model gives outputs that are just numbers. So it makes a lot more sense to turn it into a beautiful, colorful map. And the darker areas um, are, are areas that are not easy for grizzly bears to traverse. And the lighter areas, especially that light, light yellow, are essentially pathways that my model suggests grizzly bears can take to get from one protected area to another. And so if you use your imagination, you might see a bit of a triangle. So work with me here. You'll see Glacier National Park, American Prairie Reserve, and Yellowstone. And those three nodes of the model um, are in a triangular shape, but also there are some pathways, again, use your imagination, that look almost like a triangle. That triangle is critically important for bears to disperse between because it will allow for them to move from one protected area to another and maintain genetic diversity so that the populations can continue and conservation can be successful. Right now, we don't have grizzly bears at the American Prairie Reserve, but they're coming. And so we as a conservation community want to make sure that those pathways stay safe and protected so that they can move between these areas. Well, that's great. And it's, it's a wonderful visual. It looks like rivers connecting mm -hmm. up the, the different pieces. And, and uh, you know, I think that kind of data visualization, something you do very well, but is really important to getting people to understand, uh, as you said, really masses and masses of data distilled down into a simple image. Absolutely. So, and, and again, it looks, Josh, I'm just going to say it looks yeah. like a simple image. And you know, you know this. Um, in many states, we make images like this, where we look at what is the connectivity in terms of which habitats can promote or facilitate dispersal, animal movement. Um, and what's great about Montana is that there aren't lots of big cities in the way. You know, there aren't, isn't tons of urban sprawl everywhere. But what is in the way is agriculture. So cattle ranches and lots of different crops, wheat fields in particular and millet fields are in the way and interrupt a lot of these corridors. It is totally possible for grizzly bears to walk through a cattle ranch or walk through a wheat field and get from one place to the next, but landowners don't typically like it. It's pretty threatening and can be frightening to a lot of landowners. So yeah. that's where the human bear conflict work comes into play. We try to identify uh, the intersections of you know, cattle ranches and right. grizzly bear corridors to make sure that everyone can be safe. That's right. And, and you know, it's interesting because I remember study in, in Southern India, which had tigers moving through tea plantations. And it wasn't that they were well loved in the tea plantations and they did it at night and they would stay in the riparian, the river areas, but they were able to go places no one thought they could go. And I think mm -hmm. that's, the bears are, are really capable of doing that as well. They're, they're finding the, the, the pathways to, to new homes. And mm -hmm. that's really exciting because I mean, as, as biologists or as human beings who care about conservation, um, I think these are really happy stories, mm -hmm. right? And we need optimism. We need sort of conservation optimism to be part of our vocabulary because not everything is a disaster. Um, it may feel that way, but it's not. Right. And that's one of the beautiful things about studying black bears and grizzly bears is that there's so much that's been working. You know, there are right. so many examples of success, you know, in particular, just the numbers increasing. And that means it's possible for other carnivore species, for other wildlife species all over the world. There's still yeah. a lot we need to figure out, mostly in terms of conflict, but we know that it's possible to keep these animals from the brink of extinction, which is so which is wonderful, especially on Earth Day, when we want to yes. feel hopeful, we want to feel in control and like there's progress being made. Well, and bears are, you know, it's been 51 years, right, since the first Earth Day and bears are doing a lot better now than they did in 1970. Yeah. Sure. So that's really good, a good point. So you study these wonderful charismatic animals, lions, bears, grizzly bears, black bears. Um, what's, what, you know, this sounds like a wonderful life, um, but what's been a sort of unexpected challenge in doing this? You know, what are the things that people don't think about uh, in terms of, of the mechanics and or the, the logistics of studying bears? Sure. 
So I really appreciate the poll that was given to our participants at the beginning of uh, this event, because one of the poll questions said, you know, have you ever encountered a, a bear? And I think the majority of responses were, yes, I have encountered a bear. And you all are so lucky. I commend you because to this day, and again, I've been studying black and grizzly bears for 12 years now. I have never accidentally encountered a bear, not once, not on a hike, not on a camping trip. Every time I've seen a bear, it's been on purpose because I was looking for one. And so one of the big challenges is that it takes me a long time. I'm usually looking for a particular individual or a particular type of bear in a particular type of ecosystem. And a lot of people think that I, you know, fly in or drive in and in a matter of moments, I'm, you know, collaring a bear and making it look easy. When actually sometimes I'm camping for 10 days at a time, two weeks at a time, looking for these animals or I'm setting traps for these animals. And because the traps are so humane, they just wiggle out of them and disappear. Um, so it's certainly not as easy as it looks. Sometimes in a summer where I'm hoping to get collars on 10 bears, I get collars on three of them. It's still great data, but there's a lot of losses. You know, there's a lot of misses in this work. And, um, you know, it's still fun. It's still wonderful time in nature that I get. But I, I always want to clear up that misconception that it's just all action all the time. You know, that is certainly not the case. It's a, it's a lot of downtime and reconfiguring strategy for sure. Yeah. And, and I think every biologist has had days, weeks, and months when their study animal just vanished. Mm -hmm. Right, particularly when you're studying large mammals and they are mobile, mm -hmm. right? They can be where you are not. But then there are the sort of normal days in the life of a, a, of a biologist. And I was wondering if you sort of tell us, um, you know, what a good normal day in the, in the life of Ray Wing Grant bear biologist would be. Oh, I have some of the best days, I will say. And when I was thinking about it, you know, in preparation for this event, I was thinking to myself, well, I've got to talk about hibernation because uh, investigating black bears, especially in the wintertime is when I get to see these cutie pies, all of the cubs. And a little bit of a background, um, black bears are born in January. So as far as we know, as scientists, every black bear that's ever existed on this continent was born in the month of January. It's pretty consistent, which is amazing because that means the mama bears give birth during hibernation. So in their den without having eaten food or drank water in quite some time. So it's this huge feat of strength. And um, when they're born, they're super, super vulnerable and it's not safe for researchers to go looking for them. But at about eight weeks old, so about the end of February, beginning of March, is when we researchers go and do little bear checkups. And a day in the life of me, and please forgive me for this overhead helicopter noise, but a day in the life of me. Thank you for muting for a second, Ray. You'll come back when the helicopter is gone. Um, one, one, one minute, we're waiting, we're waiting. Um. So we can talk about the impact of uh, noise on bears another time perhaps, <laughs> but so excuse me everyone. Um, but the day in the life of a researcher like me when it is hibernation season is so exciting and very, very adorable. So it's a very simple process what we're doing. We are going in to find a female bear that we think will have given birth um, she has a GPS collar around her neck, so we know exactly where she's denning. She will be sleepy, kind of drowsy, not completely asleep because she has these little ones running around the den bothering her, but she'll be a little drowsy. And the first thing we do is we, we dig out part of the den and we have this long stick, looks like a broomstick with a little syringe at the end. And we give her a little shot, just like you're getting a flu shot in your arm. It's called a jab stick. And so we just kind of poke her in the shoulder with a sedative so that she falls completely asleep. And then we work very quickly. We pull out the babies, we count how many there are. There's usually two, there's sometimes three. If it's a miracle, there's four. We figure out the sex and that's what I'm doing in this picture, believe it or not, although I'm smiling so big, I'm just trying to figure out if it's male or female. And we give them an ear tag. As you can also see in this photo, we just give the babies a little ear tag. We do not give them a pit tag or anything else. 
um, but basically something that we can see from a distance so that we know that they are a study animal. And we weigh them and measure them and then put them right back in the den with their moms. Sometimes if they have to stay out a little bit longer for the checkup, we'll stuff them into our jackets, which is the cutest part of a day in the life of a wildlife biologist is having a bear cub snuggled up with you. And it's because they're too young to thermoregulate. They can't create their own body heat. So they need it either from their mama or from me. And, um, and that's it. And we put them back. And the idea is that we are going to look for them again six months later. So we look in the summertime for the little black bears six months later to make sure that they're still alive, to make sure that they're healthy and they're grown up. That gives us a lot of data on survivorship. And the great news, as Josh alluded to earlier, is that black bears are doing great in this country. They, you know, all of my survivorship data is 100% for the most part, because we're seeing them being born in the winter and then still with their moms healthy and big in the summertime. And that tells us a lot about population growth and the health of the ecosystem, that the ecosystem is giving them enough resources to grow and thrive and that mom is healthy. So I have to say, hiking in to a bear den, pulling out babies, snuggling them for a few minutes, taking their checkup you know, data and putting them back in is one of the highlights of my job. And I always think that if someone isn't convinced they should be a wildlife biologist after seeing that, then you know, there's just no hope because it is absolutely wonderful every time. Well, that's good. And, and you know, I think that you know, so much of field work is these moments of pure joy, you know, separated by days of, of watching animals <laughs> sleep. I, yes. I remember I asked George Schaller why he liked to study carnivores. He said, they sleep a lot so I get to read, right? And um, carnivores, carnivores do as anyone who has a dog or a cat knows, they, they like to sleep. They sleep a lot. They're I'm telling you, they're just like people. They love to eat and they love to sleep and they love to live in beautiful places. So, you know, we have a lot in common with these guys. We do. Um, and so tell me, um, you were you know, moved by uh, watching wildlife programs on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a couple of kids of your own. What do you, what mm -hmm. do you tell kids, uh, you know, if a young person is interested in becoming a wildlife biologist, um, what would you say? Yeah, gosh, I... I had a hard time in middle school and high school. And so I hope there's a lot of parents tuning in, you know, that might have kids of that age because I loved science. Oh my gosh, I thought it was so fascinating. Any type of science, biology, chemistry, physics, I just thought it was amazing. I remember once coming home from school and talking to my mom about gravity, you know, because I didn't, I, I don't know, I, I was watching nature shows and I guess I wasn't watching enough, you know, physics shows, but I didn't know that there was an equation for understanding gravity. And I just remember coming home and saying, did you know there's an equation for this? You know, this is just fascinating. So despite my love for science, I really did not perform well in school when it came to my math and science classes. I didn't get very good grades. There was never a point in my life where I got really excellent, excellent grades, even after all that school that I was able to do. Um, and by some miracle, honestly a miracle, I was not too discouraged from pursuing math and science um, as a career. And so I really try to impart that to a lot of young people that I work with, a lot of parents that I work with. Um, you know, my catchphrase is follow your passion more than your performance. You know, getting a bad grade can signal to you that you don't belong in a certain field. And I really think disregard that if you're interested in it, if you find it fascinating. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of people who do really well on tests and a lot of people like me who don't. And I don't think, you know, for a field like wildlife ecology or in the environmental sciences where the mission is to, you know, protect the planet, to come up with solutions to better understand how to keep a balanced, healthy planet, I don't think that your potential is locked up in your test scores necessarily, your potential for contributing to all these fields that are gonna make the world a better place. So that's my thing, passion over performance every time. Um, I'm not telling you to not study for your tests because you right. know, do your best to do well in school. But if if you're not you know, getting straight A's, it doesn't mean you don't belong in this field. Well, and Ray, I think you worked at least twice as hard as a lot of students I had who, for whom the math came easily. 
-hmm. but you, you know, you, you did not let it stop you. You learned your statistics, you learned modeling, you, you know, <laughs> well, no, sweat, sweat, lots of sweat. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell me, um, you're also, as people can tell, uh, a wonderful communicator and really like to talk to people. And I was wondering, um, would you mind if we showed, uh, if we can get it to work, which is always questionable on, can we embarrass you with a brief film clip? Uh, yeah, I think I can handle it. I'm prepared okay. for this. So this is a film clip with me talking about my love for science communication. Let's try it. I became inspired to study bears as a child, but I didn't have my first experience in the outdoors until I was in my early 20s. That really helped me realize that this work was something that I could be excited about forever. Go, 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 go! There's often a misperception that carnivores are dangerous to people and need to be eradicated. Bears are actually really important for ecosystems to stay healthy. Every type of organism is impacted by top predators on the landscape. This is a mama bear teaching her three cubs how to catch salmon. My hope is that we can figure out how humans and bears can peacefully coexist. My name is Ray Wynn Grant. I'm a large carnivore ecologist and a National Geographic explorer. NGS does great, great work. And yes. it's just wonderful that you're working with them. Um, so one more question for me, and then we have got, oh, 28 open questions in the Q&A. So I've answered a couple typing as I can, but uh, so, if you were to tell us, you know, you've had, uh, you know, a wonderful career so far, um, what comes next? You know, how do you, as they say, how do you top this, right? Black bears in the West, uh, grizzly bears in the, in the mountain, mount, intermountain West. And what's what's going to be next for Ray? <laughs> Um, I have this awesome new project. I, I, oh gosh, I'm going to try to keep it concise, but I am now working in a landscape that is so close to home and by home, I mean like where I was born. Um, so I'm working in the central coast of California in an area called the Jack and Laura Dangerment Preserve. And there's a map here. And if you can see the map kind of comes to a point in the ocean and there's a little, a little dot and it says Point Conception. Um, so that's a really important place where, you know, the Pacific Ocean, the Northern Pacific Ocean is separate from, you know, the Southern portion of the Pacific Ocean and these uh, waters come together. Um, historically, this was a really important point in uh, Chumash Indian heritage. So this was, Point Conception was a place where the Santa Inez band of Chumash Indians would send off their dead in canoes. So it has this incredible cultural significance. And this um, wilderness preserve is home to black bears, to mountain lions, and to a lot of marine mammals, including marine carnivores. It is a breeding ground for great white sharks right there off the coast. Um, and there's also elephant seals and sea lions and just an amazing diversity of large, small, medium, terrestrial marine carnivores. Um, and it's right here in California. So it's, you know, a hundred or so miles from Los Angeles and it's, you know, 40 miles from Santa Barbara. And it's this amazing area of coastline. And it was ranched for a long, long time. So there were a few cows, not a lot, but a few cattle on there for uh, many, many, many decades, about a hundred years. And then three years ago, it became um, purchased by a private donor and became the Jack and Laura Dangermond Preserve. So scientific research has not ever been conducted on this landscape, not ever. And I'm so privileged to be the first carnivore ecologist to start up a study here. Right now we're gathering the basic information, which animals are there, which species, are they calling at home? Are they just passing through? How many are there? How are they doing? And the study is going to grow and grow and grow over the course of years or decades. And we're gonna understand the connectivity of this habitat to other patches of great carnivore habitat, the conservation importance in this region, and also 
whether mountain lions and black bears are preying on sea animals, which would be just a tremendous, super unique finding. So everyone stay tuned because probably by the end of the year, I'll have some really cool data and announcements to make, but this is gonna be my research home for the foreseeable future. And I am so pumped. I'm so pumped to be the first person to do this and you know, also to work in this amazing landscape. Well, and you can work there all year long because it's just in your backyard. Absolutely. And the bears don't hibernate out here, I don't think. Um, so I can follow them around all the time. And I will say, you know, I'm based in Santa Barbara, California, and uh, we had a bear in Santa Barbara not too long ago. It was running through some avocado um, orchards, uh, actually at a friend of mine's house. And so that is super, super rare, but kind of speaks to this idea that these animals were historically here and need more space and are looking for resources, especially in drought years, like what we're having. Um, and there's a lot to understand about them in every part of the, of the country where they exist. So I'm doing my best, but I hope everyone else can join me. Great. Um, well, you know, it's fantastic. And, and for people who don't know the, the history of the Dangermond Reserve, uh, Jack Dangermond, who, who helped set it up, created something called GIS software. <laughs> right, so he he started uh, uh, a company that has built an empire around uh, visualization and mapping and data analysis, and it's been remarkable. He has been an incredible uh, supporter of conservation as well, mm -hmm. and so it's wonderful that you've got that place and and the connections to TNC and University of California in Santa Barbara. It's, it sounds like a perfect landing pad for you. I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate. It's it's really amazing. And, you know, one of the things that is extra special about this project in terms of what's next is that um, the Santinez Band of Huge Chumash Indians are a huge part of everything. All the research, including my project, um, the permission to do work in this, you know, historic heritage site, cultural heritage site, um, you know, some of the archaeology that's being done on the site, um, you know, the indigenous community is a major part of all of this work, which really sets it apart from a lot of the other work I've done in the past. Um, so I am also learning a lot about people, about communities, about human histories here, and it's extra special. So stay tuned. Wonderful. All right. So we've got a whole bunch of questions and, and let's try and get through a few of them. There are a lot of questions about radio collars and why they're so big and you can put really little ones on birds. So why do we have to put such big ones on bears? Ah, sure. The batteries are really big. You know, I, I know that I know for a fact that there are people, um, particularly people at National Geographic Society, they have a huge basement that's the engineering lab and everyone's trying to make smaller and smaller and smaller GPS collars for large carnivores. And we're getting there. Um, right now they're big and clunky, but they're very lightweight. So they do not at all damage the animal or harm them. And the collars are also, we keep them pretty loose. So loose, in fact, that sometimes the bears just kind of pull them off. Um, but it's coming, the technology is coming. All this is very expensive. So I will say, if you are in any kind of position to donate to a conservation organization you believe in, even the Cary Institute, please do because a lot of us doing environmental science work, we're always funded by grants and we're always money limited. So getting the best, smallest, you know, collars requires research and that research requires funding. Um, but it's on the way and no need yeah. to worry about the animals that are doing it. And, and it's very much like everything else in our life digital. It's the batteries, it's the batteries, it's the, the batteries. batteries. The, chips, mm -hmm. the chips are this big, right? Yep. And yep. we get the chips smaller and smaller, but, um, and yes, I mean, some, you answered another question in that, so that's great. Do they fall off? Yeah, of course they do. Uh, the, yep. the goal is to put them on tight enough so they don't, but not so tight that they hinder growth and mm -hmm. movement and eating. And so there's always a, a trade-off. So if you're doing it right, they fall off occasionally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and and you know, it's a lot of people, so there are two other sort of themes. A lot of people has asked about bird feeders. You know, if my garden's fenced, is that sufficient? Depends on the bear, depends on how high the fence, I assume. But also, does taking them in at night help or the bear is going to come during the day? So, uh, since so many people have bird feeders and bears, I know it's not your expertise, but any insights? Yeah, I do have insights. And I feel very apologetic to say this. Bird feeders are not good for 
bears. Whether you take them in at night or not, they're not good for bears. Um, they're just okay for birds. You know, they're kind of like, they're not harmful to birds, but they're not, birds don't need your bird feeder in order to have a healthy, balanced diet. So unfortunately for everyone who loves seeing birds being attracted to your bird feeder, if you are attempting to reduce any type of conflict or attraction to bears, raccoons, other mesopredators to your property, you have to get rid of the bird feeder. Again, bears have plenty of nuts and seeds in the forest, but it might take them, you know, 12 hours to get a mouthful of seeds. Whereas a bird feeder offers all of that in, you know, one moment. So right. they're really attracted to it. And I am sorry. Alas, um, you know, we have a bunch of parents and a six-year-old asking similar questions. Um, the six-year-old wants to know, what do I, what makes, how can I be safe if I'm a, in an area that has bears? And some of the parents are saying, you know, I've got a feral child who likes to run in the woods. What do I do? This is great. I have an almost six-year-old, so I can completely relate and it's great. Um, and one of the easiest and best things is to be in a group of more than two. So bears are super afraid of people. Yes, even grizzly bears. They really don't like being around people. And groups of two or more are noisy enough that the animal will hear you way before you encounter it. And so that is the best thing to do. I doubt many six-year-olds are going out on hikes by themselves, but having a parent or another person with you is enough. Um, having a dog, having some sticks that you clap together every so often as you're walking yeah. or walking bells, very bell, loudly. Bells, bells on your ankles. All of those things, they signal to animals like, oh man, here come those people again. And they usually get out of there. It's very likely that almost every time you've been on a hike, there has been some type of predator around and they've heard you first and booked it out of there. So that is my advice. Go in bigger groups, you know, have some fun all together as a family. Yeah. And, and I think there are situations, somebody asked, how do I keep bears out of my orchard? And the answer, it's really hard because, you know, an apple tree, I've got a bunch of them that have been cracked up by bears and apple trees have apples in them and apples are delicious. And as you said, bears are food oriented. So, I mean, I think the other thing is when you see a wild carnivore, give them their distance, right? You know, be respectful, don't mm -hmm, taunt them, mm -hmm. don't get between them and their kids, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it is, I think harder and harder. Whole bunch of people are asking about hunting. And I know hunting is a really difficult question, but you know, as bear populations recover in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey already has a hunt. New York has a limited hunt. You know, um, what what's the impact of the hunt? You know, is it, you know, what what are your feelings about it? Obviously, none of us likes to see bears shot, but but from an ecological perspective, is it damaging to the bear populations? Okay, so it's, it's, if I take my opinion out of it, it's actually a pretty clear cut answer. So I will say two things. The first thing is that bears do not need to be hunted for their populations to be controlled. So it's often a, a myth to say that the only way to control a population of bears is to hunt them. That's not true. And at the same time, hunting bears, if it's, if it's the correct capacity, so the correct limit of bears that can be hunted in the season, will not negatively change the trajectory of their population growth. So in Nevada, I was part of the team that came up with the equation to decide how many bears could be hunted each year without the population declining. And we, you know, it turned out that it was 20 bears in Nevada in, 20, in 2011. We found that if 20 bears were hunted a year, the population would continue to increase. Um, and it wasn't fun for me to work on that, but the, you know, the facts are the facts and math is the math that there, there are limits here. And so always checking those limits and rechecking them and making it an iterative process is the correct way to do it. Okay. Uh, so here's one from somebody who is a, a aspiring wildlife biologist and a future mom. How do you balance it all? You know, superwoman, right? How do you do it other than, you know, I you know, met your husband just before the show and he seems lovely, but, <laughs> but uh, how, how do you do it? Um, goodness, you know, there was a, a woman in my life who 
who I um, was very inspired by. And she told me to get rid of that word balance from my vocabulary. She said, there is no balance. Um, instead of trying to balance things, think of your life as a pendulum that swings. And one end is work and one end is family. And sometimes your pendulum is going to be in the family space 100% of the time. And sometimes it's going to be in work 100% of the time. And your goal is to try to get it in the middle if that's what you want, you know, but sometimes it's just going to swing back and forth. So I've used that kind of as my motto for a while instead of trying to achieve balance. Um, but it's really hard and there are big sacrifices and I've learned a lot along the way. Um, I leave my children and my family pretty frequently in order to spend time in the field. And that's super non-traditional for any parent, let alone a mother. So I go away for sometimes, you know, five weeks, you know, to do field work. And that's not okay with everybody. And that's not okay with every partner. So it has been really, really challenging for me to do that, but it's what I want to do. And it's what I've communicated clearly to my family members. Um, I will also say I have a number of colleagues who bring their kids to the field. Um, and that's an option too. I choose not to do that. I study large carnivores. And so it just doesn't seem fitting to have a, you know, a little kid around large carnivores, but there are so many examples of field biologists who take their kids around the world, you know, into the field and it works great for them. Um, I could do a whole, I, maybe one day we'll do a whole seminar on how I make it work, but I have to say, I have a really supportive partner who helps me so much in this and we do our best. So um, I, I think we are coming up on the end. Uh, there are so many good questions here. Um, so uh, what we'll do is uh, we're gonna try and capture the Q&A and then Ray and I can uh, pin some answers to folks and post them on Absolutely. the Terry website. Uh, Lori, you can type me a note and tell me how we do that and where they should go look at it. Um, so one question, which is a sort of cute one that, that uh, a colleague asked, which is, you know, he saw a sow, a female bear with four cubs and she essentially ferried them across a busy road. And are, you know, is that the kind of things bear moms do that they're really good moms and, you know, because, you know, they know how to navigate traffic uh, and their kids may not, um, they, they will help them ferry across the road. Have you seen that kind of thing? I have seen it, yeah. I've seen it with my own two eyes and I've seen it in my data a lot. Um, when, when people tell me they have sighted a, a bear, uh, very often it's a bear mama taking her cubs across the road. And, you know, anyone out there who's a parent probably gets it. You know, you have to go places. You have to go where the food is, where the resources are. You got to feed your kids. Um, but also you need to make sure that they safely cross the road. I will say, especially for you New Yorkers there, um, uh, vehicle collisions are a huge um, fatality source for bears. So a lot of cubs don't make it. They try to follow yeah. their mamas and, and the mama doesn't get to them in time and they don't make it. So please be careful. You know, it's spring now and bears are coming out of hibernation and they are little and they're crossing these roads. Please be careful because they're the cutest ones and they are the future of this planet and of conservation and of our whole world. Well, thank you, Ray. That's a great place to end. Um, let me just say, I would like to thank uh, Harney Tees, who sponsors all our uh, public lectures, and, and they're a local company, um, even though they're a global distributor of, of fine teas. Um, and uh, as uh, we said at the beginning, uh, our next carry science conversation um, is uh, going to be on saving our trees, preventing Im uh, imported forest pests. Uh, we've got a lot going on, so go to our website. Uh, Ray already has said it so kindly, so I don't really need to, but we always appreciate support wherever it comes from. Uh, and we appreciate more than anything else, Dr. Wingrant, your support and your being here on Earth Day. Thank you very much. I know it's three hours earlier, so you have a wonderful evening with your family <laughs> and uh, okay. enjoy the rest of Earth Day. And everybody who came tonight, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your participation and we'll see you again soon. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Thank you so much, Josh and Carrie Institute. This was lovely. Be safe. Bye.